Good afternoon to Mile High Flood District board members and staff, and to any visitors who may be watching this video. Every year or two, we take the board on a tour of recently completed projects. It's a great opportunity to show you some of the awesome projects we get to build. But it turns out that sticking 50 of us on a bus on a 100 degree day isn't too COVID friendly. So this year, we're going virtual. Even during this pandemic, the work has gone on. Projects are still getting built, and what a year for projects it's been. In this video, we're going to showcase three recently completed projects that will demonstrate how messy and expensive flood mitigation can be when there's no room for an open channel, how maintaining flood conveyance through our restoration and maintenance work can be challenging, and how preserving an adequate stream corridor makes it possible to create multi-objective, lower maintenance infrastructure. First, we're going to join Watershed Manager Teresa Patterson at a capital improvement project in unincorporated Adams County called the Dahlia Outfall. We're building a large underground pipe to serve the Dahlia neighborhood, which has no stormwater conveyance at all. In fact, this pipe that I'm standing in right now will be completely full about every other year that we have, once a year, every other year. This project was jointly funded by the Mile High Flood District and Adams County through our Capital Improvements Program. The Dahlia Street Outfall is one of the last small pieces left in a bigger system to serve the Dahlia neighborhood. It has, this project has been going on for at least 10 years and this is one of the last pieces to put the major storm sewer in to convey water north into the, de the Dahlia Detention Basin. This project benefits not only the neighbors in the Dahlia Outfall area, but also the businesses and those that frequent the area. The streets flood very frequently, and that has disrupts traffic quite a bit. There's no open channel here because the neighborhood was built without any consideration of flood risk. And so now there's no place for an open channel to go because there's nothing but buildings and industry taking up space. The partners on this project are Icon Engineering that did the design and BT Construction who is doing the construction of the pipeline. One of the major challenges with this pipe was that it's 20 feet deep, sandwiched in between an irrigation canal on one side and a recycling plant and asphalt plant on the other side. It has to cross the irrigation canal with overhead electric and it's also going through a landfill at the same time. The difficulty with crossing the O'Brien Canal is that it's an irrigation ditch that runs 365 days a year. They pretty much have water all the time. And so shutting down the ditch to allow us to cross it without having to divert water around it was a big issue. One of the challenges with this project of crossing the O'Brien Canal is that they only gave us three weeks to do the construction. We would typically like several months to be able to do just that piece of the construction under the canal to remove it, build the pipe, backfill, and reline the concrete canal. This is the type of project that is messy and expensive when there is no open channel to convey water. All the landfill material that we dug out had to be trucked to another landfill for disposal. The cost of this piece of the project, which is only about 2,000 feet long is $4.2 million, which is about $2,100 per linear foot. Had this been an open channel, we could have done it probably for about four or $500 a linear foot. Wow, what a tough project, Teresa. Thanks for sharing. Make no mistake, the Dahlia project will make people and property in that neighborhood safer, but when there's no place for an open channel, you know, a physical stream, sometimes the best option we have is to dig across a water supply canal, through a landfill, and down a city street to put a pipe in and bury it. Pipes like that take a lot of time and a lot of money, and it's a perfect example of why we are adamant about preserving land for stream corridors. Next, we're going to travel to a maintenance restoration project on McIntyre Gulch near 2nd Avenue, where a family literally lost part of their backyard. There, we'll join watershed manager Brian Kohlenberg. 
So we're here in Lakewood at the residence of the Cotters on West 2nd Avenue. And I'd like to take you back to McIntyre Gulch and show you a little bit about a maintenance project that we completed just recently. We're coming back on the side of their, their house, essentially through their driveway, because this is really the only access to McIntyre Gulch in this area. We don't have the luxury of McIntyre Gulch being a wide open floodplain area. It's a very confined, restricted area. So with the Cotter's permission, we came in and helped them do this project. You might remember two years ago that they gave us a video, and I call it the My Backyard is Washing Away video that I showed at the board meeting. Well, this is the backyard of where it all happened. And you might remember it was this bank here next to this tree that started disappearing. So let me refresh your memory and show you that video. Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Once we took a, a look at the Cotter video, we realized right away that something needed to be done fairly quickly as she has uh, young children and we certainly didn't want to have any problems with somebody falling in. The Cotters in the city of Lakewood asked us to participate in a maintenance project to stabilize the stream bank and the bottom along this property with public safety as our number one goal. Immediately, two concerns came to mind. How are we going to access this very confined drainage way with a large construction equipment and will we be able to preserve the Cotter's backyard? Due to the limited access along the driveway and the low utility cables, the boulder size was reduced from 48 inches to 36 inches. This allowed us to place the boulders with much smaller equipment that would fit through the access. Yeah, standing up on top of the, this wall, you really don't understand how tall this wall really is. We would have preferred to build a wider and more open channel to avoid building this big structural wall altogether. But when we're left with a tight quarter like this, it's close to impossible without relocating people out of their home. Our partners on this project included Olson for the design engineering. They also included the city of Lakewood as one of the project sponsors. They included Vies Construction, who did the construction of the wall and everything and Arrowhead Landscaping, which did this wonderful landscaping for the property owners here. Uh, the district uh, was represented by Darren Bradshaw as the construction manager. The Cotters were very happy with this project and how it turned out, but I'm going to let Cassandra tell you firsthand what she thought. Um, hi, I'm Cassandra Cotter, and this is my property here off West 2nd Avenue, and um, urban drainage has come, and helped us rebuild uh, the retaining wall here that washed away a couple years ago during a, a flood. And um, the project has just been really important to us and has helped us out a lot. We have two small children that we were afraid of getting into the creek and um, the team has just been really great at uh, making sure everything was safe, keeping fences up, keeping our kids away from the water and um, Via's construction was amazing, super early every morning, worked through snow and rain and really did a great job building a beautiful and very strong wall um, that uh, we've already seen working. We've already had a couple huge rains and it's definitely been much better than in the past in terms of keeping water flowing and off of our property. We had no idea what to do to make this a safe place for our house and also the creek and all the animals that live in it. So we're really grateful that the team came and worked on it. Thank you, Mrs. Cotter, for those kind words. We don't often get to hear directly from the people we help, so that was very gratifying. And well done, Brian and Darren. But that was a lot of rock you guys were forced to truck in there because of how confined it was. We have an open channel here, but when we have to practically airlift the construction equipment in, it makes you wonder, what's this like when we have more room? Well, let's join Watershed Manager Barbara Chung Tua to find out. We're going to join her at a capital improvement project on First Creek, upstream of Tower Road in Denver. I'm here at First Creek Park. 
a project that we did with the city and county of Denver. A project cost of $2.2 million where we were able to leverage both public and private funds. This project was challenging. Within this space, we demanded a stable First Creek, a regional trail with safe crossings of First Creek, and a neighborhood park. Thanks to Denver and the developer, adequate space was provided that made the First Creek corridor enhancement project possible. Right and smart decisions early on ultimately benefited the community in the end. With ample space, as you can see here, we were able to create a six acre park that has both formal nature play structures as well as nature play elements integrated throughout. There is over five acres of native vegetation as well as 88 new trees and 160 new shrubs. We put in a regional trail for First Creek that connects to the Highline Canal Trail as well as taking the community down to the Rocky Mountain Arsenal National Wildlife Refuge. With the trail in place, we also put in three safe crossings of First Creek. And thanks to our consultant team and our contractors, which includes Jacobs, Valerian, and Great Ecology. And Naranjo Civil was the contractor that built the project. This project is meaningful, especially to me, because it's creating a refuge for our community, especially the youth, in the middle of Denver to reconnect with nature. The emphasis of this park is to encourage explorative play, allowing our youth to engage with all five senses of play, with sight, with sound, with smell, taste, and most importantly, touch. This is a great example of what you can do when you have adequate space preserved. Not only are we able to bring in both active and passive play elements in this space for the benefit of the community, but when flood water comes through, we're able to spread it out, which allows water to only get inches deeper and not feet deeper which not only makes this space beautiful and healthy, allowing us to stay with vegetation for stability, but most importantly, it makes it safer. What a great project, Barb. Here we have open channel, preserved stream corridor, a place that's gonna make the community safer and healthier and obviously more beautiful too. This is the sort of thing that becomes possible when adequate land has been preserved. I hope by seeing the variety of projects in this video, you can see how difficult flood mitigation can be when no land has been preserved, how challenging our maintenance restoration work can be, and what becomes possible when we have enough space to work with. I'm Dave Scudis, Watership Manager from the Mile High Flood District. Thank you for watching this year's virtual project tour. Hopefully next year we'll be able to do this in person. Until then, stay healthy.